Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I am honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, put it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So welcome, and please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other, and with you, in an effort to bring us together. If you missed last week's episodes with, episodes with Sequoia Nagamatsu, Carla Brundage, and Lance Morrow, or Wednesday's very special episode for, with Vice President Al Gore and Roger Rosenblatt, or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Birds Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Birds Books hosts a reading by in conversation with Francine Prose and Latanya McQueen. Unfortunately, David Remnick is unable to join us tonight, but he will be scheduled into a later episode in the spring. I will return at the end, after the readings and discussion, to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you unfamiliar with Crowdcast, many of you may have noticed the chat to the right of your screen. Feel free to comment at any time throughout the evening. But if you have a question, there is a button at the bottom of the page that says, ask a question. And that's where I will go to look for your questions at the end of their discussion to share with the authors. Thirdly, there is a Birds Books Write America button at the bottom underneath your screen. That's where you can go and see our entire schedule and check out the books in case there's one that you need to have. Uh, now for a little bit about our first speaker. Francine Prose is the author of 21 works of fiction, including the highly acclaimed Mr. Monkey, the New York Times bestsellers Lover at the Chameleon Club, Paris, 1932, A Changed Man, which won the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, and Blue Angel, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Her works of nonfiction include the highly praised Anne Frank, the book The Life, The Afterlife, and the New York Times bestseller Reading Like a Writer, which has become a classic. Her most recent book is The Vixen, released in June of last year. The recipient of numerous, numerous grants and honors, including a Guggenheim and a Fulbright, a director's fellow at the Center for Scholars and Writers in New York Public Library, prose is a former president of Penn America Center and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is, dis is a distinguished writer in residence at Bard College. Please welcome to the screen. Francine Prose. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice. And, and thank you, Roger, for putting this whole thing together. It's, it's so extraordinary and uh, really amazing. And I'm so pleased to take part in it. So I'm going to read uh, from my new novel, The Vixen. And uh, the book came out at the end of June. And I've been reading from it quite a bit and doing a number of Zooms. And I've been super careful not to read the um, the parts that have, have any of the spoilers in it because the novel has certain surprises. In it. But I thought this is one of the last readings I'm going to do from it. And I thought I'll just go nuts and read the section that's actually my favorite section that has all the spoilers in it to it. So um, I don't know what you can put your fingers in your ears or if you don't want any surprises. So uh, the novel, The Vixen, it takes place in the 50s and my hero... Simon has um, has come to work for sort of, he's a Jewish guy from Coney Island and he's come to work for a very old school, very white shoe publishing company. And he's been hired to do, uh, to edit a novel called The Vixen, The Patriot and The Fanatic, which is this cheesy, lurid bestseller uh, based loosely, very loosely on the Rosenberg case, the Rosenberg executions that 
trial of Ju Julius and Ethel Rosenberg for espionage. So uh, at the point in the novel I'm going to read, um, Simon, my hero, has just found out that this entire charade he's been engaged in for the entire novel has actually been a kind of CIA front that the novel is being financed by the, C the cheesy Lord bestseller is being financed by the CIA to spread around the world um, and, uh, and make the government's case that the Rosenbergs, their shaky case, the Rosenbergs really were guilty. I think the only thing you need to know for this is that um, in the original Rosenberg case, the main piece of evidence uh, that the prosecution had was a jello box, a jello box that was cut in a kind of jigsaw, jigsaw pattern. And it was supposed to be how the spies recognize one another. They each had a half of this cut up jello box. And when it fit together, that was how they knew that they had both come from the same place and that they were spies with the same uh, aims. So, um, so Warren is the publisher, Warren Landry, who's the head of this publishing company. And Simon, as I said, is my hero. So this is Warren finally talking about, um, he begins by talking about how he was recruited by the CIA, by a, by a Harvard professor. Both of these guys went to Harvard by a Harvard professor named Robertson Crowley. Warren said, at the end of his class, as you doubtless remember, we were supposed to go to him for advice. I was flattered when he closed the door, proud when he asked if I thought about serving my country in a very interesting way. It couldn't have been less hush-hush or more straightforward. Later, of course, I understood that these end of semester conferences were mostly about recruiting, though not as it happened yours. Warren turned his palms up, look, he had nothing to hide. And that was it, I said. You went to work for the government and publishing has been a sideline, a front. I've never thought of it like that, but such a crude formulation. What is the front? What is the back? What is the middle? What tedious, vulgar distinctions? He walked me over to the bookcase, and when he turned around to face me, he seemed to have grown taller, younger, more vital. Guess, he said, take a guess. What single achievement in my long career am I most proud of? He hooked his thumbs under his lapels. I tried to think of a writer he published and championed, a Pulitzer Prize winner, a Nobel laureate. None came to mind. The company's list circled my memory, swirled, and vanished like water down the drain. I don't know, I can't. Now let me tell you, I loved the details. The details? I mean, when they'd asked me to supply a missing, a necessary detail. You know what a detail is, don't you, Simon? Yes, of course. Yes, of course, what? Warren sounded increasingly prosecutorial as he prepared to list his accomplishments. When we hear detail, we think small, but I'm talking large, historically large, monumentally large. The missing piece, the story within a story that makes the whole thing seem credible, real. I'm the go-to guy for that. The detail, the guy with the piece of evidence everyone can relate to. It's a plot point everyone can comprehend, except that people think, oh, so wrongly that no one can make it up. Well, guess what? You can, because I'm the guy who does it. I'm the lucky guy who pulls the chicken that lays the golden eggs out of his ass. I invent the chickens and the eggs. What do you mean? What am I not making clear? All right, let's take an example you might understand. The Rosenberg's magic jello box. One of the big guys came to me and said, Warren, oh boy, we need you to make up a secret signal. Some commie hocus pocus by which Ethel's brother and the Russian agents were recognizing one another. Something a little, you know, special. Something everyone will believe. I said, I'd think about it. Well, it just so happened that my wife was having digestive problems. All she could eat was jello. Do you have any idea what it's like to live with a morbidly obese woman consuming obscene amounts of jello? I wished Warren hadn't said that. It seemed like the worst thing he'd said so far, though I knew it wasn't. At least he didn't expect an answer. He 
He'd half forgotten my presence. He knew that someone was in the room, but not necessarily me. I felt sorry for Warren's wife, married to a man who talked about her that way, a more compassionate person. I'd also have felt sorry for Warren, the victim of his own bad choices, going home every evening to a woman he didn't love, to sons whose names he hardly knew. He was so unlike my loving parents, telling strangers about my Harvard education, my full scholarship, my bright future. There were jello boxes all over the kitchen. I had to throw them away every night I came home from work and dispose of cardboard containers. Sure, I was annoyed. I was taking my irritation out on an empty packet, dripping it up in tiny pieces when I thought, got it, secret signal, fit the pieces together, espionage 101. That was you, I said. You made that up. You invented the Rosenberg Jello box. Come on, said Warren. If you think the Jello box was a lie, if you think it was all invention, then the only logical conclusion, the only obvious conclusion, is that someone had to make it up. Someone like yours truly. If God is in the details, what does that say about me? You're joking, I said. I knew he wasn't. I wished he were. I've risen in the agency, higher, if not so high, that they still can't yank my chain about money. And how did I rise? The only way, by hard work, by being good at my job. Of course, before this jello thing, I'd had other major successes. Are successes really successes if no one knows about them? If a tree falls in the forest, I seem to have gotten off topic. What successes? Well, how polite of you to ask. He paused, deciding or pretending to decide between multiple options. I suppose my biggest personal triumph was Aldrich's pumpkin. I invented that too. Grew the whole big orange squash from a teensy pumpkin seed. Need I walk you through that history? That's okay. I knew it. I knew the case all too well. I'd been in high school when Aldrich, a lawyer and Justice Department official, was tried for espionage. One key piece of evidence was the jack-o'-lantern in which Hiss was alleged to have hidden rolls of microfilm of classified documents that he was giving the Russians. Once again, I can thank my family, my long-suffering wife and sons. One of my sons was carving a pumpkin and I thought, hey, wouldn't that be a terrific dead drop? So when they came to me at the Hiss case, it took no time to come all up with the detail they needed to make the evidence pop. On pop, the, an alcohol lace spray misted the air between us. Had Warren been drinking before I came in? But that's lying. Why not say it? Why not stop pretending to be the person Warren wanted me to be? Pretending to be Warren. A lie. He rubbed his chin, mock thinking. Maybe. A fiction, I'd rather say. Anyway, so what? His and the Rosenbergs were guilty. So what if there was no jello box, no pumpkin? details, as I said. The reason I can tell you all this is that no one will believe you. You think you're learning on the job? Well, learn this. I work with writers, men of enormous talent, creativity, and imagination, but my creativity is what gets things done. What words matter? Who was the one with an imagination deployed in the service of something higher than putting pretty words on a page? Who is the great writer, the real artist, not my writers, me. I'm the one whose details matter. I stared at him with a fixity that made his face slip out of focus. Was I supposed to ask why he did what he did? He'd already told me. Should I ask, how could you live with yourself? What would that accomplish besides making me feel braver and less complicit than I was? So now, you're the guy who knows it all, the brilliant young detective, but what are you going to do with all that knowledge, Simon? Go to the press, the government, they already know. Besides, it isn't your job. It isn't your business. Your job is to bring a novel in on time. Your job is to have the vixen on my desk, all buffed and shiny, a juicy, delectable little piggy, ready to go to market. Can you do that? I nodded. Good. Because look what just came in. He handed me a mock-up cover. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> um, our next speaker is Latanya McQueen. 
um, who has an MFA from Emerson College, a PhD from the University of Missouri, and was the Robert P. Dana Emerging Writer Fellow at Cornell College. She is an assistant professor of English and creative writing at Coe College in Iowa. Latanya McQueen's work has been published in Tri-Quarterly, West Branch, Pleiades, the, Arca the Arkansas Immemorial, in the Arkansas International, the Florida Review, Bennington Review, Passages North, Black Warrior Review, 14 Hills, the North American Review, Ninth Letter, New Orleans Review, Indiana Review, and other journals. Her most recent book is When the Reckoning Comes, a novel released in August of 2021. Please welcome to the screen, Latanya McQueen. Let me grab you here, Latanya. Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you, uh, Francine, for that wonderful reading. <laughs> um, I'm going to read an essay. Um, it's an older essay um, from this first book that I did, um, and I'm going to read it because I've been thinking a lot about it, especially now in the context of, <laughs> of the state of the world. Um, I wrote it during a time when Trump got elected um, and I was thinking a lot about the divides in our country and divides that we're still sort of having. Um, um, so yeah, it's just, it's something that has come up, I feel like has come up a lot now. And so I felt like I should read it. Um, and it's called A Plum Falling. A plumb line is made by taking a weight and tying it to a cord. The weight, when suspended, makes a true vertical line. It is a standard to measure what one has built. Plumb lines were once used in construction to make sure that the walls were level. They were used to plumb a wall. It is an old tool, one used throughout the world and throughout history. The ancient Egyptians used plumb lines in the construction of their pyramids. The scales pictured in hieroglyphs were plumb lines. On each side, one can see the weight hung by strings. In the book of Acts of the Bible, God uses a plumb line. What do you see, he asked Amos as he showed him the plumb. For God, justice and righteousness were the plumb line. It was God's scale, this line, measuring our own sins we've cast upon one another. In the passage of the Bible, the Israelites have failed to live to God's grace and his law. I am setting a plumb line among the people. I will spare them no longer, he explained, telling Amos that he would no longer overlook their sins. Here I am, standing at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, the only museum dedicated to the documenting the life, history, and culture of African Americans. The museum is separated into two sections. The lower three levels detail African-American history and the upper floors are of African-American culture. Not wanting to wait, the people around me head for the escalators up to see what's there first. I take the escalator down and I'm in a large room where lines are quickly forming. There are rows and rows of people filling up the entire space. They are senior citizens and they are children. They are in wheelchairs and crutches. They are being pulled along by their parents' arms. As we wait, they are sharing their own stories about what they know of the museum, about what it has meant to be black in this country, about Obama's hope. I look at them and I realize that they have been witness to so much of what lies ahead. And yet there is such a collective feeling of joy of celebration for something long overdue, and standing in the midst of them, I am overwhelmed. This will be the moment that gets me, not anything that I would experience later, but this, of being here and being able to share this moment with all of them. I can feel the ache in my throat beginning, and I have to leave the line before it comes. I find the bathroom, go into the stall, and begin to cry. It takes me a few minutes to get myself together, and when I open the door, I see a woman standing by the sink. She looks at me through the mirror's reflection and tries to smile. Are you okay, she asks. Yes, I start, my face flushed hot with embarrassment. I'm just, I know it's a lot, she interrupts, and I realize she believes I've already gone through the exhibit. She takes some tissues from her bag and hands them to me. Look, we're here, aren't we? Just remember that if it gets too much again. We're here and we're going nowhere. We are here, I think. We have survived because survival has been etched deep within our bones. And after everything that's been done to us, we are still here. 
The great chain of being or ladder of being was a hierarchical structure believed to have been decreed by God to represent all matter and life. It's a taxonomy formed in a continuous line, a ranking of the natural order of the simplest to the most complex forms. Implicit in the understanding of the great chain of being is the premise that every existing thing in the universe has its own place. God at the top of the chain, followed by angels, then humans and animals continuing on. It is meant to be an order of the hierarchy of all existence. Pseudoscientists of scientific racism drew from the great chain of being for their arguments. If there was an order, a hierarchy, then there were those that were superior and those that were below them. In the United States, scientific racism was part of the justification for slavery. It was easier to commit an atrocity upon someone when one believed that they were lower or when they believed that they were not even human at all. The Mason-Dixon line was created between 1763 and 1767 when two men, astronomer Charles Mason and surveyor Jeremiah Dixon, set out to settle a border dispute involving the land between Br the British colonies of Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. They constructed a demarcation line among four states, creating the Mason-Dixon line, a cultural border that eventually came to signify the states that permitted slavery versus those that prohibited it. In order to construct the line, Mason and Dixon lay markers through all kinds of terrain and weather conditions. At night, they would take astronomical observations of the stars to guide their way, lying on their backs as they looked through a telescope to measure the angles between the stars and the meridian, the due north line. Slaves, too, looked to the North Star. Unlike other stars, the North Star always remains in a fixed position, always pointing north. The surrounding cluster of stars creates a picture, what they thought looks like a dipper. They called it the drinking gourd, named after the hollowed out gourds used to dip and drink from water. On the cup's edge were two stars that always pointed to the North Star, and in following that line of sight, they found the star that would guide their way as they made their passage north of the Mason-Dixon to deliverance. There are so many barriers, both imaginary and visible, between ourselves and in our lives, places we are and aren't allowed to go, the different demarcations of our existence. Our lives, our history is a compendium of these lines that have been created. For instance, there's this assembly line of slaves as they marched onto boats, as they marched to be sold with their bodies on the ships lined side by side with no room to move, no room to breathe where later in the fields as they worked, their backs toward the sun as they picked cotton and tobacco, chopped sugar stalks. A stake of wood nailed to another to form a cross, placed in the ground and lit on fire. Or a rope falling down, perpendicular to the tree from which it hangs. Eugene Williams was just 18 years old when he swam south of the invisible line of Lake Michigan's beach, not understanding that the 25th Street beach was for blacks while the 29th Street beach was for whites. When he ventured on the other side of this boundary, whites saw him through stones. He drowned in the lake, his death a catalyst for five days of race riots that followed. In our present day, you can draw a single line on the map of certain cities marking the racial divide between whites and blacks. It is eight mile road in Detroit or Main Street in Buffalo or Del Mar in St. Louis, otherwise known as the Del Mar Divide. It is US 275 in Tampa and US 49 in Shreveport. It is the railroads in Pittsburgh and Hartford. These barriers have been stitched into the fabric of our country, the railroads and highways, the thread forever separating us. We are ushered inside the exhibit, but really what has happened is that we have moved into another smaller room. A guide stands near a glass elevator. He guides a group of 30 in at a time, and once the elevator has descended, he begins his speech to the new crowd that's formed. Congratulations, this will be the last line you'll have to wait in today. The, cloud, the crowd laughs in response. The guide then tells them that the history exhibit is over a mile long and that there are no bathrooms until we get to the end. Go before you start, make sure you have tissues, he says. A lot of what you'll be viewing will be difficult, so prepare yourselves. The elevator comes and I go in with the next group. We pack inside, the doors close and we go down. 
Look, a child says, pointing, and my eyes follow to what she sees. Now I understand the reason for the glass. As we go down, we can look at the walls and see a timeline counting backwards through our history. 1900, 1800, 1700, we all read out loud, and my heart whispers, say her name. As everyone counts, my heart aches in the knowledge of the Wilmington riots, of Bloody Sunday, of the bus boycotts and lunch counter sit-ins. I think of prison chain gangs, of poll taxes and literacy tests, of the cotton is king fields, of necks broken from the tightening of a noose. I am thinking of the swing low sweet chariot roads that took us home to freedom. I am thinking of all we risked and all we lost. 1900, 1800, 1700, 1600, 1500. The elevator stops at 1400. The doors open and what we've waited so long for has now finally begun. My mother once told me a story of the time they integrated the schools. They brought all the black students into the auditorium with the white ones and all the black students went to the back of the bleachers and sat together and all the white students were in the front and it was us and it was them, my mother said. We were here and they were there. Years after her death, I will relay this story to my godmother, my mother's cousin who grew up with her on neighboring family farms. She paused for a moment before responding. I remember that too. After all these years, it's really the one thing I also remember. That image of the auditorium waiting for them to call each of us down from our different groups and tell us where we should go. It's funny that between us, it's what's stuck in both of our minds. Why is that, do you think? Good question. You know, it's not that there were so few of us that we grouped together. There was actually a good mix between black and white students at every school and we were about 50-50, and I don't remember anyone telling us to sit together. By the time I got to the auditorium, that's just what it was. So who was the first person? Did someone separate the first group of Black students and tell them where to sit? Or did they just sit in the back because that's where they assumed we belonged? I could spend hours telling you of the museum, of each one of the displays and what they entailed, the hours it took traveling up the ramps to the documented centuries. I could describe to you each piece that brought to the forefront the history I've learned and made me see the realities of the stories I've been told. The cowskin whip lashed on the backs of slaves, or the fragment of rope used to lynch Matthew Williams, the colored only and white only signs designating segregation. The stool from Woolworths, Harry Tubman's shawl, Carlotta Lanier's dress. When I see the Southern Railway company car, I'm able to reach out and put my hand on the exterior. Before I leave, there is one last line I wait in, a line to go see the Emmett Till exhibit. As I wait, I listen to two students discuss who Emmett was. Did you hear about how she lied, one of them says. What? It just came out like last week. The woman who said Emmett whistled at her. She lied about it all. Everyone is quiet once we get to the exhibit, once we're inside the space that holds his casket. I realized too late that I wasn't prepared for this, and so I leave, walking away from the exhibit and towards the exit. I've seen everything by now, and there is no need for me to go back, no need for me to even look back as I find my way out. I open the glass doors and suddenly I am back where I started in the main area where I waited with hundreds of others to go in. This feels symbolic, this circling back I've done, but I will not catch this meaning until long after I have left the museum. They say that progress is cyclical, that it is not a straight solitary line, despite what we may want to believe, but it instead happens in waves. What unsettles me when I think of this is to imagine what is coming. Because with every moment of progress, there comes a moment of backlash. We have made progress and now we are seeing the tide of it recede. So I look at what's come before and I wonder how much will be repeated. I worry that when it comes, I will not be ready. I will not be strong enough to weather any of it. But I'm told that another way of looking at this is to understand that in order to finally get to some sort of end, there must be an examination of the beginning. We must understand the past if there will be any attempt to move forward. I take this weight and hold it in my hands. I feel its heaviness as the muscles in my fingers relax, letting it slip and fall through the air. 
if the weight is heavy enough, it will sink straight down, but it may not. If it doesn't, I'll watch as it swings, waiting, believing that it will steady itself eventually. <laughs> Thank you. That was beautiful, Latoya. Thank you so much. That was just gorgeous. So I, I wanted to ask you just to start off our conversation. I guess this is the first Monday since the anniversary of the January 6th uprising. And yeah. I, I'm wondering if you've been thinking about, I guess, as we all have, what our responsibilities as writers are, what we can do as writers. I mean, we all know, I think, that we're at this particularly perilous and unstable and, and terrifying moment in our country's history. And, and this is a genuine question, not a rhetorical question. My question is, what do you think we can do? Yeah, that's that's a good <laughs> that's a good question, and you know, I guess. Oh man, I don't know if I can answer it right. I guess the way I would think about it, the only way I can think about it is in terms of like for me and how like the way in which I, like in my own sort of life, in the times where I have felt really dark and depressed and like stressed about the world or stressed with my own personal circumstance or felt like I couldn't go on. Like what helped me to go on was through reading other works. Right. And so, and so I think about that in terms as a writer, right? Like what we're trying to do is to connect with other people. And what we're trying to do is um, in some ways, I think, to help others to keep going, right? Not just to write about our world, but also too to write about like just human experience and to uh, <laughs> to help each other, right? And so, I guess like my answer to that is just to think like to think about think about the way in which whatever you're doing, right, might help the person. Who would read it so i guess i don't know so it's a different sort of i guess frame like a different different framing of an answer right because it's not so much like how like how writing about like what the like the circumstances of the world but thinking about like what you're writing about and how it connects to the circumstances of the world like thinking about the what that response will be you're thinking about like how that's going to connect to the other people like coming at it from that standpoint if that makes sense that's a hard question though i don't mean i don't know like how are it's you an impossible <laughs> question. i mean it's, it's an impossible question but but i'm just asking because i'm so i guess because it's something that i'm grappling with on a daily basis and I'm just so curious to know how other writers are thinking about it or dealing with it or even imagining how I don't know what how what we can do to make a difference and why we feel I mean I know I know that I feel that it's a moment absolutely not to give up or not to surrender to the kind of panic that seems everywhere but uh, but it takes a kind of constant, I don't know what self propping up that that what we're doing has a real reason for doing it, and and we know what it is. But see, that's the, like, I think that's the thing. Like, I don't. I guess for me, I'm so used to. I don't know. I've been writing a long time, but I've been like, <laughs> I've been invisible for so long, right? But what has kept me going, not just in terms of like my own writing, but just in terms of life, is like other writers, right? Even. And even writers who've maybe just published like one or two like stories or something, like I'm always reading like everybody, right? And so for me, like I'm, so I'm thinking about your, the answer to your question in terms of both like political moment, but just even just like, just in just trying to kind of like <laughs> keep going as a writer, like the thing that has always kept me going is reading other people, right? So I guess like, so think, so I'm thinking about it in those terms. So from, I guess, a writer's perspective, right? Like the, the thing that I would say is that you never know, like what, like, no, you not, you never know how, whatever you're doing is going to affect other people. You never know like what you're going to do, like who it's going to reach. Right. And so I think the danger is getting wrapped up in thinking that whatever you're doing doesn't matter. Or thinking that even if it's something that doesn't relate, like, or you think it doesn't relate at all to like, to our cultural moment or to politics, right? It still, it still matters and it's gonna to matter to somebody and it's gonna to connect to somebody 
Um, and in some ways it will be like, because it's, an, it's something that is being written now, it's still going to be a part of, a, be about our cultural moments. And that to me, I guess, um, uh, is enough. But yeah, it's hard. I mean, I don't know. I, I used to not write about like, like politics or news or anything at all. So I don't know. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> How are you, like, what are you thinking about or like how are you like i don't know how are you grappling with it i don't know i mean i i keep thinking about there's this there's this kind of wonderful uh essay by rebecca solnit about preaching to the choir which is the thing i think we all worry about you know i'm just doing this and everyone i'm writing for or to agrees with me to begin with and the chances of my changing someone's mind seem minimal but but she says the choir needs the choir needs it the choir needs to feel that we're not alone that there are people with us that there are people who are who are and i think that that's more important than ever i mean that is to feel some sense of power and solidarity and that we're in this together and so forth that, that we i had a strange experience this week i wrote um i wrote a piece for the guardian they asked me to write a piece about how I felt about uh, Joe Biden's speech about the insurrection. And and what do I want to say? I kind of soft peddled my feelings. I thought, you know, this is not the time for me to talk about how I feel about the Biden administration's position about immigration, for example, like not good, but I, this is not the moment. So, so I just said, well, you know, Trump is really not the, entire problem. It's good that he called him out, but there are these deeper things that need to be solved. So so it went up on The Guardian. And and um and usually I I can't help myself reading the comments. I mean I just do, even though I know it's kind of masochistic. But uh and usually what's happened in the past is that there are a lot of kind of trolls that just, you know, I, if the piece goes up early I know first I'm reading the UK trolls really early and then I'm reading the American trolls. But this time, what kind of shocked me was that of the hundreds, I mean, hundreds of responses that that seemed like some huge percentage of them were to the left, were, what do I want to say, were what I really felt and, and wasn't saying. I mean, that is the ways in which our country is has become more of an oligarchy than a democracy and and the way in which I don't feel that my vote counts as much as the CEO of Pfizer, for example. And so I was sort of soft peddling that. But but all these people were were right there. And it was interesting to me and, and it was sort of heartening that I had just sort of begun to express the edge of what people were feeling and that there was a kind I mean it, I, <laughs> I felt personally helped by it. I mean, I felt encouraged by it. So I think somehow part of what we're doing at the moment is, is, is trying to keep each other's or one another's spirits up and our own spirits up at the same time, because, because the, um, the ways in which that spirit is being undermined seems so legion to me and so constant and so, so frightening that it, that, that, that we really have our work cut out for us. I mean, I didn't write about politics for a long time either, but but since, well, since 2016, I feel like I have no choice. Yeah. Um, that's interesting about the preaching to the, or feeling like you're preaching to the choir. Um, and yet, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it in that way, but yeah, she's right in that we still, we need to be reminded um, I know, I know, I know, or I know not only do I need to rerun it, but I think it's, it's helpful to still, like, even if I'm reading something that does align with my worldview, or if it is something, or if similar to my own experience, it is still helpful to, to know that there are other people out there. Cause I do think you can still, feel isolated, right, in your world view, or you can still feel uh, like, you can still feel isolated in the sense of that you're kind of only going through that same experience, or you're kind of only going through that same sort of thinking. Um, um, 
but yeah, I don't know. It is, I, I don't know. It is sort of, I guess on the, the other hand of that, right? Like there is that sort of, and maybe that fear of that we're all kind of, maybe we aren't really, maybe the things that we are writing aren't necessarily reaching um, the people that need to, to be reading it. Um, it's, you know, I don't know. I think, I, I feel like a similar thing would be with like, so I wrote, my novel is, uh, is the, the novel that I wrote is like a, I guess it's being marketed as like black horror, but it's really sort of, it's like horror, but it's like a Southern Gothic and it's dealing with um, marginalization. Um, and it's like the primary character is like, uh, she is so, <clears throat> she's a character who uh, is so, has been so affected by the white gaze that she does not know her sense of, she doesn't have a sense of self. Um, and I think for, uh, and it also too is largely sort of about white supremacy and how that affects not just uh, how black char characters see themselves, but you know, how like white people also too have, have uh, seen themselves. Um, and so it's been interesting because I do think the book, uh, I, I, I do think a lot, I, th I do think the ways in which it's been marketed, uh, like it should be for those groups too, but it's also, I think other people too should be reading it um, as well, have sort of not entered the conversation as well. And so, um, but I think that happens with like a lot of marginalized books, right? Like they sort of kind of frame them in these like narrow sort of parameters. Um, and so then it becomes a situation where you're sort of being marketed to the people, you're being marketed in a way where it should be like these other groups too that sort of get ignored, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, so um, what are you reading now? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm reading a couple of things. I'm reading uh, this uh, book by Peyton Marshall um, called The Good House. It's like a dystopian thriller. Um, and I'm also too, I've been trying to read a lot of poetry because um, I'm not. Oh, me too. oh really? <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been thinking this is the way, and actually we visited friends for the New Year's and I brought them a book of Zimborska poems. And I thought, mm. you know, this is like, what I think we should be doing. Like there's something about reading poetry that's incredibly helpful or I don't know what, I mean, it just seems so, like I've been working through, I've been reading a lot of Louise Glick lately. Okay. Mm -hmm. She's so, the work is so beautiful and I don't know. I mean, it just gives me a kind of faith in beauty and aesthetic beauty and wisdom and the way in which you can use language to just you know, the thing that Emily Dickinson said about feeling like the top of your head has been lifted off, you know it's poetry. Well, to, to do that for one another, that we know we're in the presence of something larger and older and deeper than our daily, you know, than what's on the latest newscasts. Are you, do you, do you read when you're writing to you? Yeah. You do? Do you yeah. read the same like types of uh, genres that you're writing? I read mean, anything that comes in the house. I mean, oh, really? I, you know, I don't, I really, not for one second, do I imagine that my writing is going to be influenced or negatively influenced by anything I read. I mean, I hope, you know, I've heard people said like, oh, I can't possibly read Tolstoy while I'm working, you know, and I'm like, in your dreams, do you imagine that you're going to get elevated in some way or change or something? So no, I read, I read whatever I can. I mean, I, you know, what, or whatever I need to, or whatever someone asks me to, or et that's cetera. Interesting. That's interesting. Cause I don't, I, I, I kind of go through phases of one or the other. So that's interesting that you do it when you're both. I wanted to ask you too. So, cause you've written so many books. And so I wonder like, is your process similar for each one? And then also to like what, uh, I, <laughs> Because I, I feel like now, because I've written one of a different, of, like, I've written a nonfiction book and I've written a novel, right? And so now I'm trying to start something different. And so I'm worried about if I can, if I can do it again. And so I'm sort of, I, I guess part of my question is like, is I'm curious in terms of what your approach is, but also too, I feel like for me, I'm looking for advice too, on like how to kind of get at, past the like first sort of book struggle. I don't, you know, I don't know, Latanya. I mean, my only... All I can say is my process, it's like I write a sentence 
and then I write another sentence, and then I write a sentence after that, and then I look back and see if there's anything even vaguely worthwhile in those three sentences I've written, and hope that it gives me the courage to write a fourth sentence, and so on and so on. But I, you know, I think that I think that the more you think of it, and the more the more you think of it in more abstract terms the more difficult you make it for yourself. I mean, for, for me, writing fiction is like, I have this story to tell, and do I think anyone's going to be interested? Or do I think I'm interested? Or do I think there's some reason why I would be telling this story? Although, the is there a reason? That's a question that I try not to ask myself until near the end. I mean, really, the question is like, is this interesting? Am I interested? Am I am I excited to get back to work in the day? I mean, which isn't to say that every day is a good day, as you know. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's, do I feel like I'm pushing, like I'm Sisyphus pushing some stone uphill, or do I feel like there's a kind of momentum and a kind of interest in what I'm doing that just keeps me going? And and those are the things that I rely on more than anything else. I mean, you know, the more you think about the world or other people. I mean, I'm talking here not about political writing, about about fiction. The harder it becomes. I mean, because you want to, I don't know, I think you want to just get out of yourself and get out of the world and get into some realm of pure storytelling that reminds you of what it's like to, to create one thing happening after another. Does it get... <laughs> Do you like? Does it get so like trying to kind of get like to not? <laughs> I don't know how to phrase it. Like, does it ever get, or does it get hard in the sense of like, do you ever like feel like, like I, I guess insecure? Because everyone I know is like, there's always it's always a struggle, and there's always like insecurity that kind of infects the thing that they're doing, right? And infects them from keeping going. And so I'm wondering if that ever, like if that ever happens, or is it just that you, you just sort of have managed to find a way to just sort of focus on, like on the on the thing that you're doing in itself, and that all the other sort of stuff doesn't come into play at all. Does that make sense? So like, yeah, no, the writers, I mean, the writers I know who I admire the most, who I really, really admire, seem to me, I mean, these are friends of mine I'm talking about, the most uncertain and the most insecure. I mean, the, the, the most completely untroubled, perfectly secure people I've ever met about their work were like the least talented writers I ever taught when I, was teach, when I used to teach writing. Like they were sure that they were just cranking out perfection line after line. But I, but I don't think that's my situation, and I don't think it's anyone, you know. I mean, there's my son's a musician, and he told me this great story, which I've always thought about, which is, and I think it comes from Art Pepper, and he said something like, um, if you're going out to play a solo and you're not nervous, the chances are that the thing you're going to play isn't going to be any good. Hmm. And that's, I found, I found that, like, amazingly encouraging, like, you know, whatever, it's not, it's never going to be easy. And it doesn't, my, in my experience, it hasn't gotten easier. I mean, I can't say, oh, I've written all these novels. So now it's just a cakewalk. I'm just like, you know, no, it really is not like that at all. Every single thing is, has difficulties of its own. And in a way you want to keep doing the more difficult thing, the thing you haven't done before, the thing that scares you to do it, or the thing that, that, that you find intimidating, or that I find intimidating to do. Um, yeah, I mean, if someone had said to me, you know, you want to write a comic novel about the Rosenberg execution, I think that is an insane idea to want to do. Who would want to do that? But because it seemed so unlikely, and because it seemed for various reasons, the only way I could approach the subject, that's what it turned out into. So how do you push through then? Like, is, does it just, the, you just focus on the work? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, what, you know, and, and you just try and get those other voices out of your head, however you can. You know, the voice of the culture, the voice of the people 
who don't like your work, the po voices of all the people who haven't taken you seriously, the voice of the people who, for one reason or another, think you can't be taken seriously. You just have to do whatever you can do just to shut them up and, and go to work. I mean, it's that's part of the challenge, I think. Hmm. How did you, I was, this one, this book is interesting to me because of the, the tone of it too. And so like, I'm curious, like how you went about, like how you went about like hitting, like hitting those notes, right? Because I do, I, that, it seems like such a hard thing to do, right? To get, to, to get it to, to work right and to be effective. Um, um, so like what were you, I don't know, like, I don't know, that's a, this is a hard question too, I think, right? Because it's like, how do you, <laughs> you write like humor or how do you write something that's like, that feels like totally, totally different than other things that you may have done in the past, right? Um, um, but I was interested in this one because like, it does feel uh, like I could, I could get that, I could get that in it. Um, well, yeah. it was partly because the subject was so daunting. And I was so worried. I mean, I, you know, I'm in some ways I'm, I'm so worried about sentimentality. I mean, I really distrust sentimentality and it really scares me because it seems like a kind of potentially a tool of fascism. I mean, I think of, you know, I often, often think of uh, uh, Lenny Riefenstahl's film Triumph of the Will, you know, which, which is like, so aesthetically beautiful and so sentimentally mo moving and so evil. And I think about the way in which beauty and sentimentality have been used for absolutely the wrong purposes. So, so I was really trying to stay as unsentimental as I possibly could. And, and of course, humor, I mean, we know from like Flannery O'Connor, let's say, or any number of writers that, that humor is one way to, to work against sentimentality. So that so that was the way that I knew I could possibly approach the subject. Um, I you know, that's interesting. Like I feel like like Amy Humble does that. I feel like with grief, and then Laurie Moore does it too. Like that kind yeah. of that like dark humor. Um, well, just... Zizi Packer. Zizi Packer is a great example mm, I mean, yeah. she, because she's taking on stuff that is so tough, and because it's it's funny it takes a moment to realize how tough it is. So, you know. That's a good, yeah. That's, <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of that as an approach. I guess my fear would be that I would not hit the right, I wouldn't hit it right in terms of humor. And <laughs> it would just be like, it would either, I would either go too far, I guess. And then it would be maybe not offensive, but like it would go too far or it would be not enough. So it would either just not be funny or it would be like, it's, I don't know, <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe if I'm like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of how, I guess I, I wouldn't, I don't know, I don't write, I don't, I, sometimes I can be satirical, I guess, but like not, I don't know, I guess it's just like a tough, I feel like it's a tough voice to pull off well, that's why I was it's, really tough, it's tough, it's it's not, I'm not going to tell you it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm so interested in like like you, yeah. you know, because like it's, like I'm curious like how you even how you think about it or like how do you like like write like the dialogue and or um these like sort of like this interiority where you like it's like hitting these right notes and like like how do you or like do you did you like like read parts of it or passages to other people to see if like 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 to get their response or do you just sort of or you just sort of just trust in this voice that you've created and that, whoops, and that it's enough. Um, well, best case, best case, I'm not there. You know, best case, yeah. I've like left the room and I'm writing. Best case, I have these voices like, I'm like taking dictation from I don't know where. And they're just speaking through me. I mean, like the little piece I read, I had put up with this guy, this, this manipulative, old school editor publisher for the entire novel. I mean, I had put up with him the way my character had put up with him. And, and the moment at which I decided to just let him rant and just reveal exactly who he was, was thrilling. I mean, it was some of the most fun I've had writing because, because I was just hearing this guy just rant the way this guy would rant if he were a real person. And, and I wasn't, it wasn't me. 
there really wasn't me. I am nothing like this person. I am nothing like any of the any of these people. And it, and that was partly why I loved doing it was that I just, you know, I get sick of being. I've been me for a very long time, and I'm I get kind of tired of it. I mean, you know, one of the things I was going to ask you about was the difference between writing fiction and nonfiction because nonfiction we're writing as ourselves really and fiction we're writing as somebody else and um and it's kind of why i like writing fiction better i just for a while write rather be another person oh no that's a great question answer it <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I guess i'm waiting for that answer <laughs> i guess for me like for i mean also too like i like fiction i tend to it tends to be about like historical stuff or real stuff that happens right and then with nonfiction, i'm also too interested in like speculative nonfiction, right that like blurs the line between fiction and nonfiction. so for me like the genres are kind of messy um i sort of kind of come at it with like with nonfiction. i'm usually trying to kind of work through something um and i guess it's easier for or it's easier for me to write because it's usually like I'm able to just I'm able to distance myself better with nonfiction than I am with fiction for some reason, um, and I don't know why that. Maybe it has something to do with oh, that's trauma. So that's so interesting. <laughs> I feel like it has to do with trauma somehow. Like I don't know. Like there's this. I'm able to like I, like I'm I tend to be very distant. I think that works in talking about trauma. And a lot of the writers that are like that I read, right? They sort of have that same sort of pulled backness in terms of writing about trauma. Um, and so it can kind of, it can work more in nonfiction, I think, and as an attempt to like, so like when you were talking about avoiding sentimentality and using humor to do that, I think that sort of distant pulled back narration, sometimes it works for nonfiction and for that same sort of way, but it's harder with fiction to do that same sort of thing, right? Because then you have uh, like, people can't connect to the character, right? But like with nonfiction, you're already like i guess because of the genre you're already sort of connected in a particular way um but yeah i don't know like i'm always sort of i'm always interested in work that is trying to blur both of the forms um in one way or the other um and for me there's like a lot of blending of both and both of the things i'm doing i have a quick question for latanya from pierce uh how has the political moment in COVID influenced the writing your students are consuming and creating? What do they seem most interested in? Oh, in terms of COVID, I mean, I don't know if COVID has affected their right. Like I teach primarily undergrads. And so um, they are interested. I think with a lot of students, they're interested in, in like, uh, like commercial genre stuff. So um, like high fantasy, um, some science fiction, um some uh <clears throat> some sometimes like uh like social critique a little bit um and i don't know i guess in some ways i mean in some ways for them because when we did do i don't know what it was like for you francine but for covid when we switched to online um we used like it was we were able to do different sort of models of working together um so in some ways it helped them a little bit more um because they were able to do more sort of kind of group projects or individual projects that sort of that helped them better in a way that like um being physically in class day to day like didn't um yeah that's that's <laughs> that's a good question yeah i don't know i don't but yeah i don't know if it's affected there like they are sort of I think because of the type of institution that I'm at and uh, where we are, like they're sort of enclosed in a way um, um, that, other, like that, I guess that other places they wouldn't be. I do teach African American studies, though. In that class, they are really they do write and they want to talk a lot more about political moment. Um, but it's that's a different sort of thing. That's a different sort of class. Francine Nancy asked, "What guides you toward your stories?" That's a very general question, but I... Well, uh, well, you know, no, it's, it's a good question. I mean, it's usually it turns out to be something I've been thinking about for a really long time that I can't get out of my head. And it's, a, you know, so, or some image that sticks with me or something I saw that I can't forget or something a story a friend told me that I can't... And, and, and it just keeps turning over and turning over until it, I just figure out a way to retell that story or get to that story so it's it, it's the test of time in a way if i can't if i can't shake it i feel like i have to write it do you ever get like 
does it do you ever get an idea and then like you go to the page and then you try to kind of work through it and then you realize that this isn't working out does that ever happen <laughs> you're joking right i mean this book took i had i started 14 drafts of this book before oh, i my. even got to the first and i can and, and a friend of mine said number them it's useful to number your draft so that's how i know there are 14 and they just kept mounting up and mounting up and out and at some point i printed them all out and it was, uh, and it was like Phew. And then various things happen and I figured out how to do it. But yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, you make one mistake after another and then somehow it's not a mistake. It's, so, it's also mysterious. I mean, a real, as you know, it's yeah. also mysterious. It's so hard to talk about because it's, it just feels like some mystery you're tapping into. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Ladies, this has been wonderful. Our hour is up and I don't want it to end. We could go on all night because I love hearing from both of you and I'm sure everybody else does here as well. But I am going to have to sign off. So I want to thank you both for your time and your art and your sharing of your process. And the discussion was, was really quite impactful. So thank you very much. Um, Thank you to Francine and Latanya for participating in Write America this evening and to everyone who tuned in tonight. And thank you particularly to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each and every Monday evening. We hope to see you next Monday as we welcome Susan Shreve and Thomas Becker to Write America. Please remember Bird's Books has the author's books and many of them are signed. So don't forget to come visit us. And thank you again for tuning in tonight.